Test, Test. Wunderbar. Hallo. Moin Moin, herzlich willkommen zum Netzpolitischen Abend, dem 33. heute. Draußen ist es kalt, hier ist es schön warm. Äh, so blöd das vielleicht auch für einige von euch ist, dass sie jetzt keinen Sitzplatz haben. Uns freut das natürlich riesig, dass so viele von euch da sind. Ähm, vielen Dank an die Seabase schon mal, dass wir hier sein dürfen. Vielen Dank an euch, dass ihr hier seid. Vielen Dank schon mal an die Sprecherinnen und Sprecher, die uns heute bereichern werden. Wir haben ein buntes Programm zusammengestellt, wie immer. Zuerst wird Alex etwas über eine neue Art der Vorratsdatenspeicherung, oder so neu ist sie gar nicht, erzählen, die Vorratsdatenspeicherung von Reisedaten und was die EU-Kommission dazu so plant. Dann, äh, ah, I better switch to English now. Um, then we'll have Claudio and Maria uh, from Tactical Tech, who are here to talk about commercial surveillance and who will show us who is tracking us and who will introduce their new tool, Trackography. And last but not least, there's Fiona, who will talk about the chaos, how's it called? Well, the, the chaos mentors um, and the concept of the chaos mentors. Um, many of you might know it. Uh, for those who don't, well, I guess Fiona can explain better than I will. <laughs> um, wie immer werden wir nach den Vorträgen eine kurze Phase mit Rückfragen, Diskussionen und so weiter machen, wenn ihr nicht aufgenommen werden wollt. Wir haben nämlich wie immer einen Livestream, dann stellt euch für diese Sessions dann bitte kurz unter den Bogen da hinten. Da seid ihr nicht im Blickfeld der Kamera. An der Stelle auch Hallo an die Leute, die zuschauen von wo auch immer. Schön, dass auch ihr dabei seid. Und wir haben uns für dieses Mal was ganz Neues überlegt. Wenn ihr Twitter zum Thema, zum heutigen Abend äh, Herzliche Einladung, unseren Hashtag zu benutzen, 33NPA. Ihr dürft natürlich auch alles andere verhashtaggen, aber es wäre cool, wenn ihr den auch benutzen würdet. Wenn Leute aus dem Stream Fragen, Anregungen oder sonst was haben, dann auch gerne unter dem Hashtag. Wir haben jetzt hier keine Social Media Wall und so ein Kladderadatsch, aber wir gucken zwischendurch mal nach. Wenn es da Fragen gibt, versuchen wir die auch einzuspielen. Ja, jetzt würde ich aber mal sagen, los geht's. Alex, schön, dass du da bist. Auf geht's. Dankeschön. Ja, das äh, Thema ist die Vorratsdatenspeicherung von Reisedaten, kurz PNA, Passenger Name Record, und ähm, der entsprechende neue Vorschlag der EU-Kommission zu diesem Thema. Als allererstes mal für diejenigen, die es nicht wissen, was ist eigentlich PNA? Ich hatte schon gesagt, eben Passenger Name Record, also Reisedaten. Und äh, in dem konkreten Fall jetzt geht es um Fluggastdaten, ähm, die eben auf Vorrat gespeichert werden sollen. Und in diesen Fluggastdaten, das sind so bis zu 60 Einzeldaten, die pro Passagier und pro Flug gesammelt werden, darunter eben Informationen, was man so isst auf dem Flug, ähm, ob man vielleicht äh, gesundheitliche Schwierigkeiten hat und da bestimmte äh, Assistenzdienstleistungen braucht. Oder aber auch der Höhepunkt des Ganzen, ein, ein Freifeld, in dem dann ähm, die ähm, Leute am Flughafen zum Beispiel oder auch die Personen, bei denen man eine Reise kauft, äh, alles Mögliche eintragen können. So unter anderem auch Sicherheitsbehörden. Und da stehen dann zum Beispiel so relevante Informationen da drin, ähm, dass jemand ähm, Taschenlampen mit ähm, Marihuana-Aufklebern dabei hatte. Es gibt auch äh, PNA-Daten, wo dann drin steht, dass jemand einen Apfel dabei gehabt hat oder ähnliches. Also es sind halt sehr weitreichende Informationen, die da gesammelt werden. Grundsätzlich machen das Airlines, um eben ähm, den entsprechenden Service, den sie anbieten, auch garantieren zu können. Das macht in vielen Fällen auch Sinn. Also wenn ich eben einen bestimmten Sitzplatz gebucht habe, möchte ich da auch äh, alleine drauf sitzen und möchte es auch eben gewährleistet haben, dass dieser dann auch entsprechend zur Verfügung steht. Oder wenn ich Anschlussflüge buche, ist es eben auch ganz nützlich, wenn die Airline das weiß und dann eben entsprechend ähm, mich umbuchen kann, wenn äh, eine Verspätung vorliegt oder vielleicht ein Flugzeug noch kurz äh, angehalten werden kann, sodass man da noch mitfliegen kann oder ähnliches. Also grundsätzlich werden eben diese Daten von Airlines gesammelt, ähm, sind also sozusagen auch nicht wirklich verifizierbar, die Daten, ob sie richtig sind und eben bis zu 60 Einzeldaten mit allen möglichen Informationen. 
Und äh, diese Daten wurden dann äh, nach den Anschlägen damals in Amerika für die Sicherheitsbehörden ähm, äußerst interessant. Die wollten Zugriff auf diese Daten haben und ähm, wollten diese dann auswerten, um dann eben gegen Terrorismus vorzugehen, später dann auch eben schwere Kriminalität und ähnliches. Und ähm, die Amerikaner haben das dann auch ähm, sogleich getan und sind dann aber auch noch zu den, äh, zur EU gegangen und haben gesagt, ja, wir möchten gerne auch äh, alle EU-Fluggastdaten haben. Also alle Daten sozusagen von Reisenden, die von Europa nach Amerika fliegen oder den amerikanischen Luftraum durchfliegen. Also das bedeutet, man muss niemals nach Amerika direkt einreisen, sondern es reicht, wenn man den Luftraum von Amerika durchfliegt. Und da sollen dann eben diese äh, Fluggastdaten, zum Beispiel eben, was jemand äh, für einen Aufkleber aus seiner Taschenlampe hat, ähm, dann an die amerikanischen Sicherheitsbehörden, also an das Department äh, die DHS, Department of Homeland Security, übermittelt werden. Und da hat man dann viele, viele Jahre rumverhandelt. Man hatte dann 2007 ein Abkommen, das war dann aber nicht rechtmäßig und da musste man wieder neu verhandeln. Also nach vielen, vielen zehn Verhandlungen hat man dann am 1. Juli 2012 endlich einen Vertrag gehabt, der dann auch in Kraft treten konnte, der es eben ermöglicht, dass jetzt die Amerikaner diese Fluggastdaten von den Europäern bekommen. Das ist eine einseitige Datenübermittlung, also es werden ausschließlich Daten von Europa nach Amerika übermittelt und ähm, der Vorteil für die Europäer ist, dass dann, nachdem die Amerikaner diese Daten analysiert haben, die dann gegebenenfalls die europäischen Behörden informieren und sagen, ja, also hier äh, ist jemand äh, mit Terrorverdacht geflogen oder ähnliches und ähm, ja, die Amerikaner machen das also grundsätzlich alleine. Dann gibt es noch weitere Abkommen, also gleichzeitig mit dem Abkommen mit den Amerikanern ist dann auch das Abkommen mit Australien in Kraft getreten. Ähm, hier unterscheiden sich zum Beispiel die Speicherdauern massiv. Also äh, Amerika bekommt die Daten für 15 Jahre lang, also 15 Jahre liegen die, Amerikaner, äh, die Daten dann bei den Amerikanern und können zurückverfolgt werden. Bei Australien sind es äh, fünfeinhalb Jahre. Und ähm, dann hat man auch gleichzeitig noch ein äh, Abkommen mit Kanada verhandelt. Und bevor das jetzt aber abgeschlossen werden kann, das liegt gerade noch im EU-Parlament, hat sich das EU-Parlament nach dem Urteil der Vorratsdatenspeicherung, äh, zur Vorratsdatenspeicherung von Kommunikationsdaten entschieden, äh, dieses Abkommen, bevor es unterzeichnet wird, von der EU erstmal zum EuGH zu einer Vorprüfung zu schicken und den EuGH eben überprüfen zu lassen, ob dieses Abkommen denn grundsätzlich mit der, mit der Charta der Grundrechte ähm, ähm, zusammenpasst. Wenn jetzt der EuGH entscheidet, das passt nicht zusammen, dann könnten natürlich auch die anderen beiden Abkommen in Zwanken geraten oder sollten auf jeden Fall in Zwanken geraten. Und unabhängig davon stehen auch schon ganz andere Staaten vor der Tür, Russland zum Beispiel oder auch Ägypten und andere Staaten, ähm, die zum Beispiel auch diese Fluggastdaten von den Europäern bekommen möchten. Und weil das mit diesen Abkommen alles so toll geklappt hat, ähm, hat sich auch äh, die EU dann irgendwann mal selber gedacht, okay, wir hätten gerne auch ein EU-PNR, also wo wir sozusagen dann die Daten bekommen von den Leuten, die nach Europa reinfliegen oder beziehungsweise aus Europa rausfliegen. Das ist äh, am 2. Februar damals, 2011, einen Tag später ist dieser Block da an den Start gegangen, ähm, hat die EU-Kommission damals noch mit Innenkommissarin Cecilia Malmström einen entsprechenden Vorschlag vorgelegt, um eben so einen EU-PNR einzuführen. Ähm, die Daten sollten für fünf Jahre gespeichert werden. Jetzt kommt hier nichts. Und, aha, gut. Ähm, und ähm, die Daten sollten für fünf Jahre gespeichert werden. Dann ging es ein bisschen hin und her. Also man hat halt hin und her verhandelt mit dem EU-Parlament und ähnliches. Das ist nicht so richtig vorangegangen. Und da hat, hat sich die EU-Kommission gedacht im Januar 2013, gut, also wir fangen jetzt einfach mal an, dieses EU-PNR aufzubauen. Also obwohl das EU-Parlament, obwohl der Rat sich noch nicht geeinigt hatten, so ein EU-PNR einzuführen, hat man dann einfach mal 50 Millionen zur Verfügung gestellt, um halt sozusagen die technische Infrastruktur für diese Vorratsdatenspeicherung von Reisedaten grundsätzlich erstmal zu schaffen. Ähm, und das versucht man auch also grundsätzlich ähm, ähm, eben durch das Schaffen von Fakten eben sozusagen die, die Parlamentarier dazu zu bringen, diesem System zuzustimmen, denn im April 2013 hatte dann auch der Lieberausschuss, also das ist der Innenausschuss des EU-Parlaments, der sich mit diesem Thema federführend beschafft, äh, beschäftigt, mit einer relativ deutlichen Mehrheit und auch nicht äh, unbedingt zur erwartenden Mehrheit, äh, gegen dieses EU-PNR gestimmt. Und ähm, dann im Anschluss am 10. Juni, aha, das äh, ist dann in der Zukunft, <lacht> ähm, also 2013 war das, 
hat das Plenum des EU-Parlaments dann entschieden, äh, dieses EU-PNR wieder zurück an den Ausschuss zu schicken, also weil die Mehrheiten im Plenum des EU-Parlaments nicht ganz klar waren. Deswegen wollte man, dass, das, äh, dass sich der Ausschuss nochmal damit beschäftigt. Also man hat das sozusagen versucht, ein bisschen zu verzögern, das Projekt. Und ähm, dann kam auch noch die EU-Wahl dazwischen 2014 und jetzt ist man in einer ganz blöden Situation aus Sicht der Kommission, dass nämlich sozusagen dieser ganze Prozess jetzt wieder von vorne anfangen muss. Also die EU-Kommission muss jetzt wieder einen neuen Vorschlag unterbreiten. Der muss dann auch ein bisschen leicht abgeändert sein. Nach dem EuGH-Urteil zur Vorratsdatenspeicherung von Kommunikationsdaten. Und jetzt wurde eben äh, vor einigen Tagen ähm, der neue Kommissionsvorschlag Geleakt. Der soll jetzt auch ähm, wahrscheinlich so ab 10. Februar, können wir damit rechnen, dass sie vorgestellt wird. Und da sind ganz viele tolle Neuerungen drin, wo man das ganze Ding eben ein bisschen datenschutzfreundlicher machen will und auch eben mit den, mit den Grundrechten ähm, in Einklang bringen will. Also anstatt, dass es jetzt eben 30 Tage vollen Zugriff auf diese PNA-Daten gibt, äh, soll es künftig nur noch sieben Tage nach Sicht der Kommission vollen Zugriff auf diese PNA-Daten geben, Danach werden diese Daten depersonalisiert, also das bedeutet, da wird einfach nur der Name rausgestrichen und die anderen 58 äh, Daten bleiben weiter zur Verfügung. Und wenn dann äh, nach diesen ganzen Profiling-Maßnahmen, die man dann äh, da durchgeführt hat, äh, festgestellt wird, dass hier ein Fall von schwerer internationaler Kriminalität äh, ähm, vorliegt, dann werden die Daten wieder personalisiert und anstatt diese Daten jetzt für fünf Jahre aufzuheben, werden diese Daten nur noch für vier Jahre aufgehoben, also große Fortschritt auf jeden Fall. Und äh, im Bereich der Terrorismusbekämpfung bleibt es äh, weiterhin bei fünf Jahren. Dann hat man sich auch noch ausgedacht, dass man jetzt einen Datenschutzbeauftragten in die Passenger Information Units mit einbaut. Also Passenger Information Units sind die Stellen im Nationalstaat, die für die Verarbeitung der PNA-Daten zuständig sind. Da sitzt dann eine Person und kontrolliert dann halt tausende von Datensätzen am Tag und guckt, ob die dann halt auch richtig ausgewertet werden. Also auch großer Schutzmechanismus. Und dann hat man sich auch noch gedacht, gut, wenn man jetzt so viele Schutzmechanismen einbaut, dann sollen Europol künftig auch noch die Daten bekommen. Ähm, macht ja Sinn. Und ähm, wie gesagt, dann rechnet man eben damit, dass am 10. Februar kommt die Kommission wieder zusammen und ähm, ab da könnte dann dieser Vorschlag offiziell vorgestellt werden. Ähm, und äh, wir haben uns jetzt im Großen und Ganzen gedacht, ähm, also wir haben ja schon mal relativ erfolgreich es damals geschafft, eben diesen Innenausschuss des EU-Parlaments zu bearbeiten dass er gegen diese Vorratsdatenspeicherung stimmt. Und um das jetzt wieder zu schaffen, also der Innenausschuss wird sich ja in, in, in Kürze dann auch wieder mit diesem Thema beschäftigen und gerade eben nach den äh, Pariser Anschlägen jetzt und ähm, in der allgemeinen ähm, Bedrohungslage, mit der wir konfrontiert sind, ist es natürlich für Sicherheitsbehörden relativ einfach, gerade dafür zu lobbyieren. Und wir wollen jetzt äh, versuchen, da eben, dass ihr kurze Videos macht und euch an die EU-Parlamentarier richtet. Und das könnte zum Beispiel so aussehen. Die Vorratsdatenspeicherung von Fluggastdaten, die jetzt mit dem EU-Plänen erstens drin eingeführt werden soll, ist eine weitere anlasslose und verdachtsunabhängige, gigantische Datensammlung. Alle Flugreisen werden wie Verdächtige behandelt. Der EuGH hat mit seinem Urteil zur Vorratsdatenspeicherung festgestellt, dass das EU-PNR eine solche gigantische Datensammlung ist und auch gegen geltendes EU-Recht verstößt. Daher fordere ich Sie auf, sich für den Schutz der Grundrechte stark zu machen und sich gegen ein EU-PNR-System einzusetzen. Weiterhin fordere ich Sie auf, sämtliche bestehenden Verträge zur PNR-Datenübermittlung an Drittstaaten sofort zu stoppen und weitere Verträge in diese Richtung nicht zu unterzeichnen. So, dann, ähm, Hallo? Ja, danke. Also hier äh, seht ihr dann auch, wo es grundsätzlich mehr Informationen gibt, also zum Beispiel auch auf dem vorhin gezeigten Blog nopnr.org oder dann auch bei uns auf der Seite von der DigiGest. Und ähm, falls ihr solche Videos machen solltet, dann nutzt bitte den Hashtag nopnr. Ihr könnt aber auch einfach ähm, kurze Fotos machen oder natürlich grundsätzlich einfach so eure EU-Abgeordneten einfach anschreiben und ihnen mitteilen, dass diese Vorratsdatenspeicherung von, vor, äh, von Fluggastdaten bzw. Reisedaten keine gute Idee ist. Und auch mal, um noch ein bisschen die Perspektive zu zeigen, wo das Ganze hingehen könnte. Also ähm, es ist so, dass zum Beispiel auch ähm, die Briten oder der ähm, Antiterrorbeauftragte der EU noch eine deutliche Ausweitung dieser Datenspeicherung fordern. Also PNA-Daten werden ja nicht nur ähm, 
bei jetzt Flügen angehäuft, sondern zum Beispiel auch, wenn man sich ein Auto ausleiht oder wenn man mit dem Zug fährt oder wenn man ein Hotel bucht oder ähnliches. Und da gibt es eben auch schon entsprechende Vorschläge, vor allen Dingen von den Briten, die diese Datenspeicherung ausdehnen wollen, eben auf andere Reise- und Verkehrsmittel. Und was hier droht, ist eben diese totale Überwachung des Reiseverkehrs. Und um das zu verhindern, ist es auch elementar wichtig, jetzt hier schon diesen äh, ersten Schritt in diese Richtung zu verhindern und zu vermeiden. Und deswegen ist äh, das ist sehr, sehr wichtig, dass wir uns da jetzt äh, im EU-Parlament dafür stark machen, dass diese, äh, dieses EU-PNR keine Realität wird. Gut. Danke, Alex. Wer von euch hat denn schon mal ein Video hochgeladen irgendwo im Netz? So. Ja gut, dann ist es ja Zeit für ein erstes Mal. Habt ihr Fragen an Alex zum EU-PNR, Rückmeldung dazu, zu der Kampagne, was kann man tun? Jo. Ähm, wo kam denn das Beispiel her, was du am Anfang gezeigt hast? Ähm, mit den, mit den äh, Taschenlampen. Ja. Ähm, das äh, hat, also man, grundsätzlich kann man ja bei seiner Airline nachfragen oder auch dann äh, beim, beim DHS einfach anfragen und sagen, schickt mir mal euer, äh, den Datensatz zu, den ihr so auswertet. Und ähm, mit viel Hin und Her ähm, hat dann Edward Hasbrook, der beschäftigt sich in Amerika schon länger mit dieser ähm, Fluggastdatenauswertung, so einen Datensatz eben bekommen und das ist sozusagen von, von ihm halt sozusagen so ein zur Verfügung gestellter ähm, Datensatz. Also ähm, genau. Da hinten ist noch eine Frage. Ich glaub, also so kann man Airlines grundsätzlich oder auch äh, eben das DHS, wenn man mal nach Amerika fragt, einfach mal so eine Datenanfrage machen und sich dann halt über Jahre mal ein bisschen rumärgern, bis man dann tatsächlich mal seine Daten kriegt. Ist auch ganz lustig, glaube ich. Ich weiß, du bist nicht die EU-Kommission, aber eingangs hast du jetzt gesagt, der abgeschwächte Vorschlag sagt, nach sieben Tagen wird der Name entfernt. Ich meine, da bleibt eh eine Telefonnummer oder eine Kontonummer übrig und das ist witzlos. Aber er soll nach vier Jahren oder so auch wieder eingefügt werden können, der Name. Also muss er doch noch irgendwo, also wo wird er denn dann nicht gespeichert oder wie geht das? Also ja, das, das ist ja eben genau dieser Witz dieser Depersonalisierung. Also immerhin hat man das Würden geändert, denn vor vier Jahren hieß es noch Anonymisierung der Daten, indem man einfach nur äh, den Namen irgendwo hinpackt, äh, wo er dann nicht jedem direkt sichtbar erscheint. Jetzt hat man sich auf das Wort Depersonalisierung zumindest schon mal geeinigt. Und es ist halt so, dass ähm, das dann einfach in eine andere Datenbank läuft und diejenigen, die dann mit diesem Datensatz arbeiten, den Namen nicht sehen können. Und dann aber, wenn eben sich ähm, herausstellt, oh, hier handelt es sich um schwere internationale Kriminalität, dann macht man Klick. Und ähm, <lacht> genau. Ja. Und da muss dann auch noch der Datenschutzbeauftragte möglicherweise gefragt werden. Der Vorgesetzte vom Datenschutzbeauftragten. <lacht> Ja, also das ist halt eben die Frage, wie gesagt, inwieweit dieser Datenschutzbeauftragte überhaupt da irgendwie diese Funktion wahrnehmen kann. Er wird ja nur so als, als Feigenplatte installiert. So ist es. Weitere Fragen, Kommentare, Anmerkungen? Also vielleicht auch noch so ganz witzig, also bei diesem äh, US-Abkommen ist zum Beispiel auch relativ klar jetzt schon, dass es zum Beispiel einen, einen klaren Vertragsbruch gibt, und ähm, also es ist eben so, dass diese Daten ja dann auch noch an Drittstaaten weitergegeben werden können, wenn denn jetzt zum Beispiel ein wichtiger Fall von Terrorismus vorliegt. Und ähm, da müssen eigentlich dann die Herkunftsländer dieser, also die Daten, wo die, äh, die Länder, wo die Daten herkommen, die müssen darüber informiert werden, dass diese Datenübermittlung jetzt an einen Drittstaat stattfindet. Die Amerikaner haben das nicht gemacht und die Kommission hat danach in ihrem Evaluierungsbericht das ganze Ding groß gelobt und hat gesagt, alles prima mit dem US-Vertrag. Gleichzeitig ist es so, dass zum Beispiel der Rat halt mit diesem PNA-Abkommen äh, mit Amerika auch zum Beispiel gegen Flüchtlinge vorgehen will. Also obwohl äh, im Vertrag eigentlich steht, dass es nur für Terrorismus und schwere Kriminalität benutzt werden soll. Also ihr findet auch eine schleichende Ausdehnung, ähm, Ausweitung der, der, des Nutzen dieser Daten statt. Also wie gesagt, wenn man sowas einmal einführt, ist es relativ schnell, geht es in, in verschiedene Richtungen, ähm, mehr Daten und ähm, nicht nur für schwere internationale Kriminalität und Terrorismus, wo die Daten genutzt werden sollen. Deshalb mitmachen bei unserer Kampagne. Wer lädt morgen Video hoch? Ja, oder Bilder machen oder sonst irgendwas. Okay, gut, dann ähm, vielen Dank, Alex. Ich würde sagen, wir machen eine kleine Umbaupause. Claudio und Maria.
Ja, na klar. Warte mal im kurzen Moment, ich gebe dir mal eben das Mikro. Hallo. Ähm, woher wissen die Fluggesellschaften beispielsweise, dass du äh, Marihuana-Sticker auf, deinem, äh, auf deinen Taschenlampen hast? Also wo kommen die Daten her? Ah, ah, oh. okay. Alex, wer erhebt, wer erhebt die Daten? Ähm, also grundsätzlich gibt es äh, verschiedene Möglichkeiten, wann eben so ein PNA-Datensatz äh, bearbeitet werden kann. Also das zum Beispiel, wenn du im Reisebüro bist oder ähm, wenn du... Ähm, zum Beispiel am Check-in stehst oder wenn du halt eben durch eine Sicherheitsschleuse gehst. Also in all diesen Momenten kann jemand an diesen PNA-Daten etwas ändern und äh, da in bestimmten Feldern eben einfach irgendwas eintragen. So. Und das Problem ist, dass es auch da grundsätzlich überhaupt keine Access-Logs gibt, sodass eben nicht nachvollziehbar ist, wer an welcher Stelle was eigentlich da einträgt. Also grundsätzlich haben sehr viele Leute Zugriff darauf und auf der anderen Seite ist nicht nachvollziehbar, wer tatsächlich was an welcher Stelle irgendwo eingetragen hat. Also das ist auch so ein ganz generelles Problem, ähm, um das man sich auch mal abseits von solchen Abkommen eigentlich mal kümmern müsste. Okay, man müsste mal. Ja, um, yeah. Let's uh, give a warm welcome to Claudio and Maria. Some of you might have seen them at the 30 at the Kels Communication Congress. Thank you. And yeah, well, we're thrilled to see uh, who's tracking the Berlin uh, digital societies. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. We'll be clear. <laughs> welcome to everyone. She's Maria and uh, I'm Claudio. And um, why this title, Mapping the Internet Original Scene? This is a quote of uh, Ethan Zuckerman uh, that has explained why uh, advertising is the Internet Original Scene, meaning that uh, uh, most of the content published uh, online uh, get uh, funding because uh, they publish advertising. And this al advertising business, uh, we saw that after uh, 10 years, uh, uh, is creating uh, a large collection of uh, personal data data that uh, are not uh, legally recognized uh, as uh, um, personal identifi uh, identifiable, but uh, they are still uh, meaningful in larger scale analysis and uh, many other stuff. So. Um, hi. Uh, so what's one of the most common things we all do every day? Um, I guess amongst the many things that we do every day, one of them, sorry, it's making me go deaf. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess one of the most common uh, things that we all do every day is basically read the news online. Um, I'm guessing most of us have Twitter accounts, we tweet news articles pretty much every day. So accessing media websites is something that we do every day and what we might not necessarily always realize is that this daily normal activity of ours kind of serves as a goldmine for data analysts. And that's something we want to draw attention to through tachography. Actually, this is a quote from Marek who I think is somewhere at the back, um, and he very wisely said that um, when governments collect data, uh, we call it surveillance, but when um, companies do the same thing, we somehow call it user services, uh, because we often forget that uh, when, when you think about surveillance, we often identify it with law enforcement agencies and, and government services, but sometimes what we don't necessarily realize is that in a lot of surveys that they do do is possible through, um, our th through the collection of data based on our normal browsing activities such as accessing news mm -hmm. online. Um, and that's something that we are exploring, well, uh, what we're doing is that we're exploring online tracking uh, when we access the news online through the, our project tracography. So why we develop tracography? Because uh, um, where we were interested in the online tracking business because uh, it's quite opaque. It's quite uh, not clear uh, how our data are collected. We are uh, uh, European. If our data got stored by a US company, what does it mean? And this kind of uh, geopolitical consideration. Um, we see also recently through the Snowden revelation that uh, the media infrastructure, the, sorry, the advertising infrastructure that uh, bring practically your device to connect to some advertising services is actually exploited by the NSA or by other intelligence agency because uh, they are a connection that are traveling uh, to a, a destination and uh, they can be exploited, can be abused. Um, 
And uh, basically, the goal here is not to create a tool for personal assessment, is uh, to create an uh, observatory, a system that can be used to understand how much uh, um, a country, the citizen of a specific place, uh, are exposed to other countries. So it's more uh, for uh, analysis the geopolitical of data. We have has been focused initially in the media website because the media are uh, one of the most accessed uh, uh, content uh, on uh, in every country. And uh, they are in fact uh, the um, w w website uh, that uh, if someone monitor passively how you are uh, informing yourself uh, can detect uh, which is your level of knowledge, uh, which is uh, your level of interest, uh, which kind of political preference you have, if you change your mood, if you change your goal, etc. Uh, so they are uh, like a, a mirror of the, of the society interest. So we uh, start to be focused on a media website. Um, and that. So we develop um, a script. How many of you use uh, Ghostery or Disconnect.me? You know that things. They are a tool that, uh, in fact, uh, monitor your uh, browser activity and uh, when you are connecting to some uh, tracking uh, uh, script, uh, they block the connection and report to you, you are getting this connection uh, happening. To make instead a massive analysis, we have started uh, emulating the behavior of our browser. So with uh, PhantomJS, PhantomJS is uh, Firefox that uh, run uh, in console without displaying a, a window. And uh, running a browser in this way, we were able to trigger all these automatic connections that are triggered uh, when uh, you navigate uh, on the news media. So as first, uh, we get uh, the list of uh, the news media under test. As second, uh, we perform this uh, HTTP connection. Then uh, we monitor all the third-party inclusion that are present. Then we perform a trace route. You know what is trace route? Yes, because we are technicians. <laughs> trace route uh, show the network path. Uh, later we see the, the details. And uh, based on the network path, uh, we analyze the autonomous system implied in the path and uh, the GeoIP for every IP involved. In this way, we get uh, a large amount of data uh, for every media website analyzed. Very, very near. Hello, I test the other. Does this work? I think so. Oh, it oh. does, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so essentially what we did is that we collaborated with people. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Bulgaria, <laughs> just need to be very near. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we collaborated with partners um, across 37 countries around the world. Um, we um, got them to help us review media lists for their countries. Uh, media lists which included national media, regional media, global media, and we also um, ran the script in these 37 countries. Um, by, collecting the, uh, by running the script, we're able to collect results, uh, which are illustrated in this visualization we've created. Um, so the blue countries are essentially the countries we've collected data for. Um, if we click on a country, which country was that? Australia. Australia, okay. Um, so as you can see here, these are the types of uh, media websites uh, that we have for Australia. If you select uh, one media website, um, it shows what happens w when you access that media website within Australia, within a specific moment in time. Um, as you can see on the map, uh, there are a lot of weird blue and red arcs. Uh, the blue arcs um, basically show um, your connection uh, to the servers which host the media website that you have selected in this case, whereas the red arcs show your connection to um, the servers of the tracking companies which track you by accessing uh, this website. Um, as you can see in this case, um, the, s the servers of the tracking companies are based in the US. If we click on the companies... If we click on the yeah. US. Well, if we click on the US, well, we can see, um, well, first we can see why it's red, and that's basically because the server of Google is there. So Google is basically tracking you by accessing that website in Australia, uh, likely because that, that media organization is using Google Analytics. Um, and if we also click on other websites. Ah, New Zealand. New Zealand? New Zealand okay. is, is the pink one. Yeah. Violet means that uh, the connection are just passing through, the but uh, do not answer on that nation. So New Zealand uh, Secret Services can, by theory, intercept this connection, okay. but, uh, yeah, so but they don't. If you actually click on more companies and more web websites, they also set some of the purple Yeah, you're country. right. Or yeah. I just um, select a new country. Just uh, click randomly and, yeah, or select. I don't know, if anybody wants us to select a specific media website? 
do you have something in mind you'd really want us to access from some place in the world? From the yeah. Spiegel, Spiegel from Germany? Uh, okay, cool. So we'll be national. No, it's global, maybe. No, no, it's there. Okay, it's there, it's there, it's there. you see, it's missing the feature of the uh, research <laughs> of the fact. <father. laughs> What happened okay, so <laughs> when we access the Spiegel in Germany, what we can see is, well, first of all, we can see that we have 12 unintended connections. Uh, by 12 unintended connections, what we mean is that we're connecting to the service of tracking companies. Um, within these uh, companies, in this case, we... Uh, I'm sorry, I was curious about Italy. Uh, and okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, because you discover a lot of things. In this case, uh, we discovered that uh, the CDN, uh, so the content delivery network used by the Spiegel, is hosted in Italy. And uh, good, fine, but unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, in this so case, the purple country just, uh, well, the UK in this case is purple because um, that's where the network infrastructure required to access the servers of the tracking companies and of the media websites is, is located. DG. Uh, which is DG, yeah. DG is one of the uh, company involved uh, and uh, is hosted in the US, but to reach uh, the US, uh, you pass through an uh, UK uh, infrastructure. And this means uh, that... Uh, yeah, so essentially um, this is a snapshot of tracography. Um, these results obviously uh, aren't the same across time. They obviously change constantly, uh, which is very important that you all run the script uh, from wherever it is in the world you are, based on these media websites or any websites for that matter, and that we can constantly um, gain new results and update them and c most importantly, compare results across time. Um, so basically what you can see through this, um, through this project is not only which companies track you, but you can also see have a, a glance at the politics around infrastructure. Because in many cases what you can see is that uh, your data basically travels to countries which you weren't expected to. So for example, why, well you might argue that you know, your country has very strong privacy laws in Germany, for example. Maybe by accessing a website, your data travels to other countries which don't have privacy laws at all, or which don't have adequate safeguards, if, Germ if any country has adequate safeguards at all, of course. Um, but the point is that you can see a lot of politics with regards to data, um, which is really interesting through this project. <laughs> and we really encourage you to contribute to it. But let's move on. Okay, now we touch uh, um, the network topon. Ah, was a <laughs> the network topology, uh, well, why is called user vulnerability? Well, because uh, the network uh, works uh, that... Um, no, it's not your fault. Just that uh, I'm forgetting uh, what I have to say. That is the point. I'm <laughs> your microphone just is helping me to remember. <laughs> um, well, the point is uh, the network is, is, is distributed. Uh, every user is uh, connected to the other networks. If you pass through one of the network that uh, is collecting the data because uh, some secret services ask, uh, start to develop a dedicated program, your data get connected. Is enough that uh, on the plenty connection uh, we saw uh, like unintended connection. One of those connection pass through one of the tapped network, and in that tapped network is enough to recognize uh, your user agent, your IP address, your referral. So it's still enough uh, to profile the user activity. Uh, o if someone instead uh, include an HTTPS resource, like uh, HTTPS advertising, that information will not be leaked. But uh, how's, uh, how we recently saw in the, the um, Zonda revelation about uh, the DES. Yeah. The DES um, program was that uh, um, the typical uh, behavior of the news media on um, injecting HTTP resource permit to NSA or other intelligence agency to uh, monitor foreign user, also if the connection that you are performing is uh, to a media of your nation. Uh, the difference between the blue arcs and the red arcs uh, display that uh, with the blue arcs uh, the connection required to reach the news media. Commonly you do not see it because it's in the same country which you perform the test. Instead the red one, uh, they go scattered around the world. Okay. Eh? Okay. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so as mentioned before, um, the network infrastructure, uh, the, po the politics around the network infrastructure really matter in our opinion. And I think that's kind of what um, distinguishes tracography from all those other um, online tracking projects that exist. 
Um, essentially because we, we show like, where your data goes and everything. And that's really important um, as for all the reasons that Claire just mentioned. But also because, for example, this is just uh, one of the many documents from the Snowden Revelations, which illustrates that multiple countries have um, provide access to intelligence agencies, such as the NSA, to the fiber optic cables that make up the backbone of the internet. And uh, this slide shows like 30 countries which provide such access to their cables to the NSA. And of course, Germany is also included. And these companies also, in, um, you know, host U.S. equipment. So this basically raises questions uh, with regards to what I was talking about before. That while you might be accessing a website in your country and you might think that it's safe, maybe other agencies which you wouldn't necessarily want to have access to your data do have access to it, uh, because you can't really control where your data goes to within the network of networks, which we call the internet, basically. Ah, oh, and uh, this is an uh, interesting map created by Ingrid Burriton that uh, show interactively uh, all the undersea cable and uh, if it's tapped by whom and uh, which, are the which are the telco involved. The telco here are recognized by the autonomous system number and the uh, autonomous system number is one of the way you use to map the network topology. Also, in tracography we are using that. Uh, do you remember Fox Acid? Besides the weird name, Fox Acid was a, a, an ACTA tool that just uh, intercepts uh, your um, an, H an HTTP connection that uh, is going uh, through an active content and uh, redirect uh, your connection to a server that instead of serving the active content involved, serve uh, a flash exploit. So this means that uh, um, if uh, we are uh, analyzing uh, the exposure that the user get, uh, thinking that uh, is a passive exposure. So they get uh, monitored, but they do not get any harm. Well, massive surveillance is a, is a human right violation, but uh, still uh, they do not, do not perceive uh, a real harm on their computer. Instead, this uh, uh, exposure to an attack uh, means that uh, someone can also divert your connection and uh, inject an exploit uh, and, get and compromise your device. So uh, it's not uh, just uh, a massive uh, um, issue, it's also a a personal issue for targeted attacks. Now we see a couple of uh, um, analyses that are not intended to monitor, to assess the, how much a single media is privacy aware, but uh, more uh, the exposure per country. So we said that uh, is enough that uh, one connection touch another country to assume that if this country is collecting the data, know what are you doing. So based on that, uh, we see Russia with autonomous system uh, 42,000, etc. that 100% uh, of the connection passed through Russia because, uh, of course, uh, the user with the device in Russia, the connection starts from Russia. 85% of the connection related to a local or a national news media touch US. Maybe because they have Google, maybe because uh, they have are just using a level three to reach uh, another, uh, um, another uh, third party server. Green Britain touched for the 77%, Germany for the 61%, and uh, these start to show which are the countries that are more present in our navigation. Um, you see the country, the country name and the autonomous system. Why the autonomous system is reported? Because uh, if uh, your internet service provider has a different uh, contracts with other, um, other carrier, maybe your uh, routing is uh, less performant and uh, you get more exposed. After we see Italy that uh, in two different uh, provider has get a different percentage of exposure because uh, your privacy in fact matter also by your ISP carrier uh, contract. So Norway, always the country under ISIS always to 100%. But we can see that uh, US uh, is uh, in fact uh, the most present one uh, and uh, Green Britain is the second. Selecting uh, one specific uh, country, you see how much time uh, appear. And uh, well, sorry, but uh, Europe is not uh, a country. Uh, just uh, some IP address location are associated to Europe. And uh, I have no way to say where they are because I'm based on the, the uh, RIPE uh, assignment and, uh, and so Europe happened. 
probably I will, uh, if I start to make a um, more precise analysis uh, using uh, only the autonomous system uh, number and the carrier associated, these things can be removed. But uh, at the moment that I'm more based on JYP, that is the effort. So. So in addition to, um, in addition to uh, the network infrastructure, in addition to seeing that um, most data, according to results collected for these 70, uh, 37 countries, ends up in the US, which by the way shows that the US kind of has the monopoly when it comes to online tracking globally. Um, in addition to that, we, we also identified uh, the third party companies which track users every time they access these websites. Um, here you can see the percent in these percentages, you can see which um, companies were tracking users the most in the websites in these countries. So in Germany, for example, which is right on the top, yeah, um, you can see that um, Google basically um, <coughs> basically tracks 89% of access to uh, the websites which we've included um, in our tests. And actually, if you scroll down, you can see that for the 37 companies, if I'm not mistaken, for about 35 of them, Google is the main company which tracks at least 80% of access to, um, to Every websites. Every website per count. Yeah, so the websites we've included for each country. And there's, um, except for South Africa, I think, where another company, Effective Measure, is placed in first place, and except for Russia, ah, where... Ah, this one. Yeah. And except for Russia, where Yandex is placed uh, in first place, but, but with a very 1%. yeah, with a very <laughs> small difference with uh, Google. Um, so what we can see basically is that Google is the main company which uh, tracks users when they access websites globally. Um. Yeah, and um. so uh, yeah, I guess um, many of you, if you I don't know, if you follow um, our Twitter accounts, Geography, um, and I don't know, if you happen to come across a tweet about um, how has Berlin's digital rights community been tracked in January 2015, then maybe that's why you're here. So I guess this is the important part of the talk. So um, as we just explained, um, up until now, we've been looking at online tracking when we access media websites. But trackography wasn't only developed for that. It was developed in general to explore online tracking, whatever type of website that is. As such, we tried to make it a bit more contextual, and we decided to create a separate list of websites which we thought would be interesting to run the script on. So our idea basically was to look at which type of websites um, Berlin's so-called digital rights community um, has been accessing and reading uh, over the last month. Um, please um, don't bombard me for using the, world, the, word, the term uh, digital rights community. It's very oh, broad. And cyber security is the broadest. <laughs> That, that is true, yeah. Um, the, the term digi digital rights community is very loose, um, but what I'm basically referring to is like the privacy community, the digital rights community, the anti-surveillance community, call it whatever you like, basically. Um, so by going through um, basically Twitter accounts and social media and checking what has been tweeted a lot, what has been shared a lot, what people uh, within this community appear to be reading a lot um, throughout January 2015. I go to the map. Um, no, please go back. Okay. Thank you. We created this um, list of websites. Now, within this list of websites, as you can see, um, there are some little categories, like for example, surveillance. So these are, sorry, they're not websites, they're web pages. So unlike the previous, uh, what we were talking about before, this is just web pages. So maybe you might recognize some of these web pages. Maybe you access them personally. Maybe you've been reading some of the stuff. So these are under surveillance. Then if you scroll down, there's uh, some on censorship, especially since a lot of countries um, and cybersecurity, especially since um, some countries uh, have been enforcing new cybersecurity bills over the last month. Um, the Charlie, um, well, the, the call for expansion of surveillance powers by law enforcement agencies following the Charlie Hedbo attacks. Um, international responses to the Charlie Hedbo attacks. Um, Spain's criminalization of the right to privacy. By this, we mean um, the arrest of um, some anarchists in Spain who are using um, Rise Up. Um, some, to some user of some users. App, uh, that for that reason has been mistaken. Fair that. enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, here, basically, we have some websites about um, how Google handed over uh, WikiLeaks data to the FBI. Please don't scroll so fast. Sorry. We're dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are reading it all. Huh? <laughs> no, I'm just going through quickly. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Uh, unless you're extremely bored and you want me to skip to the map, uh, skip to the map. Okay. <laughs> and other. 
Okay, and other yeah, others just because there's um, some about um, some convictions, um, Barrett Brown and tall privacy. Okay, well you can have a look at those. It's on our GitHub repository if you want to have more details. So um, our but assumptions. Essentially, these are the websites which we thought that um, which we which looks like people have been accessing in this community the most throughout January. And then the question is, how are we tracked when we access all of this, and who tracked us? So. Wait. Our new this results. community itself maybe is also quite protected. Uh, some of them are using Ghostery and Tor, etc. Indeed, in uh, indeed. It's interesting to see when uh, a specific subject uh, uh, that we can monitor, you can monitor a specific subject, uh, like also an intelligence agency is monitoring a subject and uh, is monitoring the interest that uh, is uh, raised by the population or uh, the moods of the population in that way. And uh, we just uh, try to apply the same things instead of, of address uh, all the media of a single country, some specific uh, subject. Uh, and um, Actually, um, I don't know if you managed to identify any websites that you personally accessed in this list because it was, it was scrolling through it very quickly. You were saying yes. But um, how many of you accessed at least, I don't know, three or four websites from the list I just we just showed? All right, so how many of you accessed that um, without Tor? Boo. <laughs> Okay, so then I guess our results but aren't completely irrelevant in that case. We right. also to say that uh, using Tor uh, just uh, make appear a serial connection from other uh, place. Using uh, no script or Firefox, uh, you are just uh, receiving uh, the connection uh, in the blue arcs. So only the content and not the third party. So there are many solutions after we discuss also about that. So this is uh, this map, as you can see, it only has Germany blue because this ha specifically has um, just the results we collected um, based on the media web on the on the web pages we just showed you. So uh, here are the categories. Um, so Which if one? you click on, uh, let me see, surveillance. Mm. Okay, so from surveillance, for example, A if you couple. scroll down. Ars technica, because I read Ars technica sometimes. Okay, Ars technica. Well, honestly, I just click randomly from Twitter. CBC. CBC, yeah. Um, uh, Newswire, statement from the Privacy Commissioner. Newswire. Yeah. Scroll down, please. Uh, Der Spiegel. Um, oh, the oh sorry, sorry, this one about Regen. Oh, Actually, click on all those Spiegel ones because they had a lot of interesting articles. No, but I guess uh, um, if we click on the same uh, article on, uh, on this also on the speaker, probably the tracking company are the same. We yeah, see. you might want to notice how many unintended connections um, are, how they're increasing on top and how Yeah, we selected just six articles. So it's uh, just six, so just by accessing six we I media websites, we already had 212 unintended connections and we're already tracked by 64 companies, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, and if you, Interesting uh, to be mentioned is uh, why a connection uh, is going in Hong Kong. Well, that's uh, just because uh, sometimes uh, instead of uh, the Facebook uh, data center of Ireland, uh, it uses the Hong Kong one. So yeah. And also like from the, from the list of websites, if you even um, click on the Wall Street Journal from... Yeah. F do you want to refresh this? Yeah, refresh. Cool, thanks. Um, so if you go to the WikiLeaks category, because and, sec Zuna, and second know, last, if so Zuna, if you, Zuna, you have to know is one of the worst uh, media for the tracking online. <laughs> well, we wouldn't say worst media, but they but it's worst. Yeah, but they do a lot, a lot of companies to track us by accessing the website. So, for example, in, in if you access, only, only if thirteen. You so if you access, um, yeah, if you access the the article about how um, WikiLeaks wanted answers about Google giving their stuff data to the FBI. Um, you're already tracked by uh, 13 companies. Is one of them Google? Because that would be very ironic, actually. Well, but Google is always present. Yeah, so Google's <laughs> present, of it's course. Not evil. Google's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have to know also the amount of uh, tracking services present in your navigation depends uh, from uh, some kind of factor that we have not yet uh, recognized properly. So we develop also a uh, heat map to understand uh, across all the tests uh, we made uh, if uh, the same media is serving always the same tracker. And they don't. They change. Uh, and we have still to understand uh, if uh, it's due to the advertising business or uh, which, uh, which yeah. other reason. If you have some insight, uh, please uh, tell But as, as the last thing about this, and by the way, this is live, this is online right now, so feel free to access this and 
Um, yeah, is the Trakoga Hill talk? Yeah, feel free to yeah, feel free to access this and to play around with it. Uh, check which w websites you accessed in January, um, if at all, and see who tracks you, where, where around the world your data traveled to. Maybe you'll see that your data traveled to countries you wouldn't necessarily want it to, or which don't necessarily have adequate safeguards. Um, but I think what we should mainly basically f um, focus on here is that some of the main tracking companies, in this case as well, um, are uh, companies like Google, companies like Facebook, companies which basically have been kind of compromised by intelligence agencies. NSA, uh, companies which um, have, th have data from their data centers routinely collected by big intelligence agencies, as we've seen uh, through various leaked documents. And maybe for people within the digital rights community, that actually might be an even bigger concern. Um, okay, what we can do, as last things, uh, when you find a specific article uh, and you select it, uh, you can just copy paste the URL. If you share this URL, uh, the person gets rendered directly the, the selection you, you made. Oh, and also last thing. Um, also, in in the list, in this list, we not we don't only include uh, media websites, but we also include websites from organizations like EFF, uh, Nest Politique, um, even um, we are also from our web from our from our organization's uh, website. So we even have tactical tech websites here and my shadow websites here. So uh, we're just trying to s see like what kind of tracking happens from all types of organizations when you access access type of content. W what is happening here is the next slide. So. Uh <laughs> The effect that uh, if uh, uh, your connection is not enabled online tracking, you see effectively that uh, you have one media source, zero intended connection, and uh, of course, uh, if the, the server is hosted in other country, you have to reach uh, that server, you cannot uh, avoid that. And uh, what you are going to see is that uh, the only um, recognized as unknown company is in fact uh, one uh, second level domain of the source itself. So. That is uh, what uh, we hope to see in every news media in the future, but uh, it's quite <coughs> unlikely. Or at least in every website, because it's not news media per se. But yeah, in every it would be great if uh, websites in general and uh, media organizers change their business model. Speaking of business models, uh, what type of business models do they have? Uh, these so-called trackers, so-called third-party trackers. Well, by looking at their websites, they obviously engage in advertising, profiling, and so forth. However, um, uh, Ethan Zuckerman, um, in his article about the Internet's original sin, which kind of inspired us for the title of this talk, very rightfully says that um, the Internet's original sin is basically advertising, because essentially what's happened is that surveillance has become the, the default of uh, the internet of the business model of the internet and that itself is concerning and it's even more concerning when you see for example in the previous slide Claudio. Yeah, but because there are five minutes. Okay, I'll be very quick But you probably don't want me to speak very fast. Yeah, I yeah, can. you're right <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, as um, ac Actually this so this quote is actually from uh, one of the articles in the list of websites um, the one of one of the ones about the case of um, Google handing over WikiLeaks staff data um, to the FBI, and in response to that, uh, the Google spokesperson said that, that their policy is um, to to um, to tell to inform us when um, governments request for data, but in but sadly that happens very frequently and that they that they can't because they're gagged by court orders. So this is just proof that um, one of the main tracking companies, um, Google, for example. Um, in most cases are required to hand over data without informing us, without our consent, uh, because they're just required to do so by law. And that itself is concerning, I think. Um, how do they handle our data? There's no real answer to that. We have no idea how I ha they handle our data, and that itself is the problem. We have no idea how they handle our data, because once they collect our data, they obviously share that with other third parties, they sell their data, they subsequently share it with other third parties, they share it with endless third party actors, so it's practically impossible to know what, say, in the, in the, in the end, happens to our data. What we do know, though, is that they create profiles, but we don't know what they look like, and that itself is the issue. However, in order to get a small insight into how they handle our data, <laughs> uh, we, looked at their, uh, we looked at their privacy policies. Of course, we didn't look at the privacy policies of all of the companies that we identified. We only looked at the privacy policies of some of the globally prevailing tracking companies. And by globally prevailing tracking companies, we mean the companies which we identified that track users around the world in these 30 37 countries, regardless of what type of website they access. Um, so feel free to access um, our CSV on GitHub. Uh, here we have uh, okay, here we have analyzed the privacy policies, and if you scroll on the right, no, uh, okay. <laughs> no, but because uh, it's better be okay. before maybe uh, explain that uh, we are not just uh, collecting uh, technical data from uh, a scripted run. We are collecting uh, 
many data in order to provide an open API accessible also to other uh, researcher or other analyst or person who want to take this data and make uh, uh, their own uh, thoughts. And uh, those data are composed uh, in some part uh, from the things uh, collected around the world uh, from the supporter who run the script. Some other are uh, like uh, the privacy policy that uh, Maria uh, was uh, transforming, uh, reading from the website uh, to this CSV. Now, in the future, we'll be provided an uh, easier interface to um, permit uh, supporter to transform uh, that um, human uh, readable information in a machine readable information. But in that way, we have an, an, an API that uh, contains these, these uh, elements, and in the future, we hope that uh, someone can develop uh, um, mobile application uh, or um, plugin in support that uh, take use of this uh, information to provide uh, a safer or a more informed navigation for the user. Anyway, so this is a CSV. Uh, please feel free to. Well, not so fast, but uh, it's time to close. This is CSV, please feel free to contribute to it. Okay, so there are some tools uh, for the solution, uh, but uh, in 30 minutes uh, we never uh, reach the slide uh, with uh, minutes available. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if we have a question, it's the time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, you guys. Ah, the most important things I have not said. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say? Which is the, for you? For me, it's the repository Run the link. script. Ah, okay, for me, it's the, there are a, a repository on GitHub, eh? and uh, this presentation is online. You can find the link, uh, contribute to the repository, and on run the script, because it's important. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you, and I guess we all do. Um, well, Berlin's Civil Rights Society community, what do you say? Questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Jetz from Open Data City. I have several questions. Um, the first thing was uh, when I looked uh, on your list of URLs, I noticed there was almost no domestic media in it. And how can you say it's uh, of the Berlin whatever community uh, when there's no domestic media in that list? And another thing I was wondering uh, was how did you do the mapping between autonomous systems and countries? Because uh, as far as I know, autonomous systems um, can span over several countries. And Indeed. I would be very interested in that. And uh, one question, suggestion, we were doing a, si a similar tool, it's called Datenbloom, and we did this for Wired Magazine. And we were providing it with a mask where you can type in your own URL. It would not look up which countries were involved, but it would show you the resources a website uh, would use. And why didn't you do, uh, why didn't you have an, uh, a form to submit your own URL and to, to look the data up uh, for Maybe your own website. Maybe some people are not aware about their own website. Uh, should I ask the first question? Yes. Um, so in your first question, uh, you're actually um, very right. Um, I guess I, I must be missing a lot of uh, domestic websites. Um, to be honest, um, again, the, the term Berlin's digital rights community was very loosely used. Um, and by Berlin, essentially what I had in mind is that we're going to run the script in Berlin. Um, so it's going to show what kind of tracking is happening when you access websites like based here. So that's the reason, major reason why I use uh, Berlin. Otherwise, you're right. There's not many domestic ones. Uh, the I use some domestic ones like uh, Der Spiegel and, and so forth, and some other German websites and Netzpolitik and so forth. But then um, most of them were, were basically the ones that I um, that I scraped that people appear to be accessing. Of course, um, I don't want to say that this list is representative for everything that people within the so-called digital rights community in Berlin have been accessing, but it's what appeared to be going around on Twitter a lot um, by a lot of people based here, and we just ran the script on it. Of course, it's not perfect, but what we try to illustrate through this is that um, the trichography script can be used on any types of websites. So the idea is like to create various types of lists, various types of websites with different uh, concepts, different uh, issues, um, and, and to see what kind of tracking happens in that. This was just a small experiment, which we just did over the last days. It's obviously far from perfect, but it was basically to bring the idea forward that it's not just about the media. Um, there are many other types of websites and web pages which could have interest, which would be worth exploring. For the um, autonomous system things, uh, at the moment, uh, I'm relaying only in uh, GOAP. The autonomous system, I I'm uh, returning it uh, in the REST API, and uh, I want to use that in order to manage uh, CDN properly, because otherwise with CDN, uh, you get uh, misleading information. If you depends on the CDN, uh, you can use uh, uh, you can uh, have uh, address space associated in the 
uh, main country, the owner of the CDN content, uh, like is happen in uh, the Google CDN. But in AKMA, you get uh, the IP address space of the hosting nation. So in order to address properly the CDN, I was intended to find the autonomous system of the CDN, and when a connection reached that point, say, now is in the hand of the main company. So it was not intended to uh, associate a country specifically to an autonomous system because it's impossible. At least you can associate the owner of the autonomous system because uh, if uh, level three is present uh, in all the Middle East uh, and uh, in uh, North, uh, uh, North Asia, and you know that uh, it's a US company, and uh, you can just assume uh, that uh, maybe someone has sent a national security letter to that place. Also, if uh, the location of the data center is uh, in, uh, in a foreign place. And uh, the third point uh, was uh, your services. Okay, no, the, at the moment uh, there is not a possibility to submit a new source because they need to be collected in the um, GitHub list. Uh, we are planning to open uh, more uh, the interaction of the users, uh, just uh, we have no idea what uh, can be meaningful because uh, what uh, is important here is not a tool to monitor your own website. It's uh, important to monitor a general behavior. W what uh, we are more thinking to do is integrate with the Alexa API and the amount of connected user per country and be able to say this media is bringing uh, X percentage of citizen to this country. Th that is uh, the part of the geopolitical analysis we want to do more than uh, a technical analysis of the, um, of the single website. Other question? Hey, thanks. Uh, Tons of questions, but uh, two for now. First, uh, ass assuming I'm going through an app such as Disconnect, or you mentioned Ghostry, or I work with a VPN, uh, and how far is this going to, to protect the tracking in those circumstances? The second one, uh, you describe advertising as the original sin, and I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that, but at the same time, a lot of those pages I frequently use, and I think it's great that they exist, and I think they often only exist because of advertising. Um, what do you think companies are discussing as, as alternative business models at, or what do you suggest as, as alternatives to move forward? Okay, um, for the business model uh, perspective, uh, of course, uh, my solution can be more idealistic. But uh, if you just uh, think that uh, you want to provide advertising, uh, I wonder if someone has ever tried to look for uh, uh, some ethical kind of uh, way to manage the data transparently or uh, to explain uh, how advertising works. Uh, and uh, if it's possible, force a uh, news media that uh, is uh, collecting uh, and there so many click per, per day to keep the advertising is uh, in uh, his own web farm, maybe managed by a third party because uh, not every IT, uh, not not every media has an IT uh, structure enough uh, solid to to manage this kind of services. But uh, who knows? Maybe this can be a, a long-term solution for sure. Uh, also, give to the user the option to pay the access uh, to the media and uh, get an uh, advertising-free version is something that uh, the correspondent uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Netherlands uh, has done. Also, Le Monde is doing it, but uh, in, a, in a weird way. Le Monde, you can pay. You can still see the advertising, but you have a new button that permits to remove advertising. So, in fact, uh, you are uh, seeing uh, the page without advertising, but still you are part of the tracking system. About uh, the first point uh, you were mentioning, uh, the protection of the user, well, uh, we are still uh, a minority. We are the minority of persons who care about the navigation and privacy. In this way, more than uh, um, address uh, you as community, it's important to address uh, the society and make understand that uh, this kind of behavior is bringing to some nation to obtain a shitload of uh, data that can be used against another country. And uh, when uh, we feel that an uh, uh, underground pipe is bringing uh, uh, the gas to heat uh, your, uh, your winter, it's clear, understand that geopolitical uh, relationship between two countries. But uh, when there are data, there is not still a way to misure, and that is uh, what we want to do. And a, a last comment on what you said very briefly, because we have to finish. Um, uh, well, advertising might seem harmless, um, and I guess it does, because in many ways, um, <coughs> we might say that you know th these these companies help improve our web experience and so forth. At the same time, um, basically profiling is at the heart of all of it. Profiling is at the heart of the project, essentially, and that's because. 
is, is <laughs> efficient <laughs> time. Was this me. is the point. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the problem is that profiling is at the heart of all of this. We do not have access, we do not know what type of profiles are created about us. We do not have access to them. We do not know who they are shared with or what, what subsequently happens to them. And that itself, I think, is uh, the problem. Um, but if you want, we can discuss this more later on because yeah. we have to go. Well, that's Thank it. You. Unfortunately, we're running a bit late. So, but, well, maybe because we announced it. Sandra, is there something from, from Twitter? No, no questions from Twitter. Uh, <laughs> that's good. All of you being here. The two are staying uh, and, uh, well, I, I guess are open to questions and comments and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, so. Und dann kriegen wir ein Zeichen, ob das gut ist oder nicht. Okay. Ich glaube, es ist noch über Steuer. Also so gut? Ja? Okay, super. So. Um, I switch to English now. Um, I stay in English. Um, so just give me a second. So, hi, I'm Fiona. I'm um, part of the team that organized the Chaos Mentors for the Chaos Communication Congress last year and the year, be year before that. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, the Chaos Mentors, in short, or Chaos Partner in German, um, are a program that is aimed at people visiting the Congress for the first time, and we've been doing that for two years now. And I think there were some insights and lessons learned that I happily share with you tonight. Um, so, let's see whether... Yeah, perfect. So I first just quickly, briefly explain you what we wanted to do, how we did it, what we learned from it, and um, yeah, why we did it, and hopefully suggest you some ideas to take home or to discuss later when we shift this entire thing to the bar. So what are the chaos mentors in short? Um, we have the program that started two years ago, and as I said, we are aiming at supporting people visiting the Chaos Communication for Congress for the first time. I bet a lot of people of you have been there, but for those who haven't, the Chaos Communication Congress is a congress that is happening annually since now 31 years, and it's dealing with a lot of topics and issues ranging from net politics to making, security, and also arts and beauty, and offers a wide range of workshops too. And it is organized by the Chaos Computer Club, the Hackers Association from Germany, and it's happening between Christmas and New Year. And over the last years, or decades actually, the Congress has grown tremendously. So I think back in the days in Berlin, it um, offered space for about three and a half thousand people, I think. And now we shifted it to Hamburg, which uh, gives shelter to more than 10,000 people, or over 9,000 9, people actually, or even more. And um, hence, the Congress has opened up a lot and has become really, really big. And this is where the Chaos Mentors actually jump in. So what did we want to do? Um, we really appreciated this development a lot and we wanted to encourage people to join in because people tended to have um, fear of going there or intimidations for all kinds of reasons, just maybe because of the sheer amount of people in one spot, which can be very intimidating, or because they felt like they are not real hackerishy enough so they wouldn't fit in. 
I wanted to encourage those people to still come by. Um, and we did this by, we wanted to offer support beforehand, answering people's questions, and being contact people on location. And yeah, we basically just wanted everybody to have a great Congress because we had to have a blast and we wanted everybody else to have a blast and we wanted to um, facilitate that. So how, do, how did we turn those goals into action? Um, there were basically three fields for us to, get to become active and we usually started off or kicked off a couple weeks before Congress started with a, with a post on the official event blog of the CCC where we were announcing, hey, Chaos Managers is happening again, you can register. And we asked the people to register with an email and telling us about something about them, maybe if they've got specific needs, if they had certain fears or what they are interested in or what they wanted to learn. And um, I think this year we had 100 mentees applying. Um, last year we had also 100, and usually you get 20 to 30 people spontaneously joining you, and we had 35 mentors. And I see some of the mentors here, and also some of the mentees, which is really great. Um, and we also asked the mentors to tell us what they are interested in. i come to the sense of that later. Um, yeah, and we take a lot of time for answering everybody personally, um, which is a bunch of work, but it really pays off because for a lot of people, all their fear and anxiety is really turned into excitement after um, getting a personal email by a so-called human being who is really nice and who takes care of their needs and make sure, hey, whatever you need, we we'll take care of it, feel safe, feel convinced that there's, it's going to be great. And um, yeah, so when we get all these emails, we um, we get actually to the core of our work. So answering these people personally has been already the very, very important first step for people actually feeling welcomed and um, being excited about Congress. What we do then is the matching, which is uh, basically we print out the GWAR issues and match them so there's no smart uh, matching algorithm sadly at hand. Instead, we first cluster the people by their interests. So if you're a huge podcast fan, you're very likely to find yourself in a group of other totally crazy podcast fans or one of the five groups of totally nuts podcast fans. Um, so that, and the idea of this is that you later get a mentor assigned, but you also have a group already with which you can, like, you know, somehow like-minded people that won't talk about anything else but podcasts. Um, and then it's also very likely that you'll have a mentor assigned to your group who's also really crazy about podcasts or a podcaster. Um, although I, I don't want to promise anything, but yeah, that's how it usually worked. Or you have somebody, uh, a couple of people that really want to build a robot, for example, are really excited about robots. And we had this really crazy mentor. He brought his entire robot building suitcase thingy and built a robot with them, which was really cool. Um, yeah, so we match them. And as soon as the mentor has his mentees, he writes them, he's then responsible for them. He makes sure they're all psyched up about Congress and um, arranges a meeting with them. So the, first, the third field of action um, then happens at Congress. So we have a really nice decorated assembly. We hand out those flyers. And uh, I really like the second one. Take a bath in the belly bar, lose your smartphone and find another. Um, <laughs> and actually, uh, all the mentees directly run around and tick it off. Um, and, but you should pay more attention actually to the find at least one new and awesome friend. Because the thing is, we have this assembly. We meet there all together, we say hi, we welcome them. The mentors meet up with their mentees, they take a tour, they show them where do you get your matter, where do you find the workshops, they take a look in the program. Sometimes they arrange meetings too, say let's go together into this, um, I heard you like computers, so go into the Andreas Bob talk about computers and see what happens. Um, but sometimes, but here's the thing about the mentors taking care of the mentees. If anybody of you wants to be part of the program and become a mentee, we first want to test if you're emotionally capable of dealing with the fact that they won't need you anymore after a couple hours. So in German, we have this word flüge, and I think it should say it's into, correct me if I'm wrong, they spread their wings, they fly the nest, they will never call you again because they find their own friends. And this has worked out really, really well. They sometimes come back to the assembly and um, we exchange or 
they tell us what they experience, what new and awesome friends they found, and what they learned, but usually in the ideal world, they don't need us anymore after a while. So if we are that not necessary at all, why do we do it anyways? So in the past years, there's been quite a genuine interest of the press into our program, and they always ask me this, so why do you ne have need the chaos mentors? Because this actually sounds horrible, you know? It must be a horrible place if you need a mentor to guide you through it. it must be terrible people at place, but it's not. So what I always answer is, is um, well, y the thing is people need encouragement for all kinds of reasons. And I think it's not specific for the Congress that a place with 10,000 people in one space in when there's cold weather outside and all viruses whirling around and um, you know and they're all hackers and you don't know and it's very intimidating, you don't know anybody. So it can be just, as I said, the sheer amount of people. And other people sometimes, uh, what I observe a lot, oh, by the way, this year we had among the 100 mentees, we had 50% female, which was great. Um, and s uh, I observe this a lot with female attendees that they feel like, ah, they are not real hackers in a way. And you hear this from, there was this girl who wrote me, yeah, I did my master's degree in mathematicians, going to do my PhD in cognitive science. Also, I love discordianism, but I don't know if I belong at the Congress, really. And, and you're just all surprised, but they, the people have this tendency of feeling unwelcome if you don't state explicitly, please come. You're very welcome here. This is just the right place for you. So, and I, ironically, the press asks me this a lot, but I often feel like, hey, all those pre-assumptions that are made usually based on media representation of the Congress. So people often expect a community of all male, white, hackers, closed up community. Well, I'm certainly not that, so, uh, and a lot of other people aren't either. So, um, yeah, people going there was the most important step, and then usually things were just fine telling from what they I heard. Um, also, we believe that Congress should be open and we want to contribute to that development and we really appreciate, or we as the Chaos Mentors really appreciate the development of Congress opening up because the issues that we are dealing with do not affect a thin Elite hackle layer anymore or never did, but affects everybody. Also, Congress is awesome um, and we feel like but actually, Congress really is awesome. I mean, um, you have so much fun, you meet so many nice people, and you learn so much. But the fourth thing, and which I think is even more important to state, is that also not only the people visiting the Congress benefit a lot from the knowledge and indulging into this huge landscape of new knowledge, it's also our community, the CCC, us benefiting a lot from being able to participate in exchange with other people, with other perspectives, and we need that. So we need to open up, and this is the best thing that can happen to a community to become more diverse and being able to address other needs, other views, and exchange. So this is something we also want to contribute to, having other people joining Congress that haven't before. And what we learn from this are four things. First thing is that obviously, it seems to me, we used to make first make clear what database I'm relying on. So we had now m probably 250 mentees that we exchanged with a lot. We had a lot of feedback loops. We talked to them. They tell us what about their experiences. And telling from what they told me and the stories I heard, the reputation of the Congress really seems to be lagging behind a lot. So it might have been very, very different a couple years ago, but it's not like that anymore. So people kind of it hasn't really made the, how do you say, it hasn't really spread yet that Congress is a great place to be and the community is really open. Um, so people still have these pre-assumptions that we are trying to, um, yeah, challenge. Also, as I said, the community is incredibly open and welcoming. I remember there was this elderly lady that came on the first day. She wasn't registered or anything and she just came to her assembly and sat down and was all, exhausted and, and she said, I, I really have no clue where I am, what this is, what to do, what is this? <laughs> and 
I talked to her, I took my time for 10 minutes and I talked to her and I said, hey, just feel free to, you know, this is a place where you can access a lot of knowledge, just talk to people, try to, you know, get into touch with people, they don't bite, they might be ignoring you, they might be rather silent or shy, but they don't hate you. <laughs> and she came back on the last day and she was all glowing and telling me, hey, yeah, I just spent four hours in the assembly hall and I talked to 10 tables and I was, uh, how did that work out? <laughs> and she had a great time. She, she, wa there was, she wasn't rejected by anybody, she wasn't let down by anybody. And I, I do acknowledge that people make other experiences too, but the people that I talked to didn't. They, all of them actually are very surprised in a very positive way. And from my perspective as an organizer, what means a lot to me is that the program has been embraced a lot from the very beginning, from the CCC and everybody I talked to. And I was actually prepared for criticism um, because, you know, we are explicitly aiming at new people that are flooding Congress and, you know, being all foreign and strangers. But nobody brought that up, at least not that I know of. And yet, I can still understand if somebody is worried about this because I think what one has to understand is that Congress is also somehow a safe space for some people, and now all those foreign people are coming, and strangers, and um, you know people they've never seen before. But I think there's no need to worry, because everybody I see here who's been to Congress, I'm pretty sure you've been at a totally different Congress than I was. So if you want to, you can retreat to your local hacker space and just hack four days straight. You can also party four days straight. Not a problem at all. It, it really works. You can do that, I heard. Um, <laughs> And you can also just skip all the lectures. The lectures are great, but you can just learn so much just wandering around and talking to so many people. So there are 1,337 congresses happening. And whatever congress you want to have, you can have it. You don't have to participate in any other congress. And one last lesson that I strongly want to share is that telling from what I learned so far is that we are really on a, the right path, I think. Just, it's my personal judgment. I'm not talking for any organization or other person, but I really feel like, hey, people are going into the same direction. We still have a lot of challenges ahead. I think especially the lack of diversity is something we have to challenge um, in the tech community in general, but I think we are heading there. So now that I've been talking maybe to some people that will never visit Congress or have never been to Congress. Um, maybe there are some, some things I can share with you too. First is, of course, you should come to Congress. If you have any doubts about this, talk to the Chaos Mentors um, because Congress is awesome. Uh, and the second thing is maybe for people that are organizers themselves. Something very important we learned is that just expressing, ex expressing your wish to for people to come already changes a lot. So if you organize an event that is maybe a tech event or, I don't know, a super left-wing intellectual Marxist knitting club, people have this, sometimes have the tendency to feel not welcomed by default. So take this into consideration. If this is not the case, you should express and communicate this as directly and straight as possible. So if you are an organizer of a tech event and you, for example, want to have more women, you want to raise the percentage of women attending, say it. Just say it on your website. We welcome women. We have a welcoming culture. We wish people to come. That already changes a lot for people. So, and also something I want to um, tell you is that there is no patent on this idea. So if you feel like this concept, idea, you name it, applies to whatever you are organizing, go ahead, copy, remix, and share this concept. And um, we'd love to see this concept spread and help other people to um, create their an event in an inclusive way and to make the community more diverse. And we'd happily share our knowledge with you. So thanks a lot for the attention. See you at 3233. And thanks for the invitation. Thank you for coming, Fiona. Thanks for your thoughts. Uh, thanks for the great work of the Chaos Mentors, welcoming people, broadening the scope of the community. Good stuff. Any thoughts on those reflections, questions, comments, remarks?
Um, some mentees have contacted me, suggesting they organize the Chaos Mentors. So um, we actually, this year, we had, I think, 10% of last year's mentees became mentors this year. And even some mentees from this Congress became mentors during Congress. Congress. So um, I'm pretty positive I probably won't do it. Um, I have never been to camp because um, I never dared to. Good idea. Very good, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe uh, just explaining, I think the reason why nobody really criticizes it from the CCC is that we all can relate to it really good. So we've been there, we've done that. We've been not visiting the Congress. So I think in 2010 was the first time I went to Congress and went home again. So I stood in front of the BCC and for a while, and then I went back home because I didn't dare to go in, which seems totally crazy to me, but I think a lot of people can relate to that, or as Tim nicely put it, why did it take us 30 years to come up with that idea? So um, yeah, I'm positive there'll be something at the camp. I won't be organizing it, but I'm pretty sure there's something going to um, evolve. Anything else? As far as I did see, there's nothing too important on Twitter. If yes, just shout. Now. Surprising. <laughs> okay, then, I think it's time for a beer, maybe. <laughs> Danke. Ja, vielen Dank euch allen, die ihr da wart, äh, mitgesprochen habt, mitgedacht habt. Thanks to you all being here, listening, thinking, commenting. Um, wie schon gesagt, die Sprecher sind alle noch hier, sind ansprechbar. Um, if you have any further questions or need for discussions, just approach the, the speakers. They're still here and happy to talk to you, I guess. And um, well, thanks to the Seabase. Vielen Dank, Seabase, fürs Hosten. Wir sehen uns das nächste Mal. Genau. Oh no. Wir sehen uns das nächste Mal, ich weiß es leider nicht aus dem Kopf, das ist das Problem. So, wir sehen uns das nächste Mal am 3. März. Äh, bis dahin eine gute Zeit und jetzt einen schönen Abend. Bleibt gerne hier, Bier trinken oder sonst was trinken. Schönen Abend. Tschüss.